thank you for coming out this afternoon, especially considering the sun finally came out. We really appreciate your effort to come to this wonderful lecture. This is not a picnic? <laughs> no, we forgot the picnic basket. Um, I'm Grace Mary Brady. I'm the president of the Bayside History Museum. And if we could, that whole row right there, um, if Diane could stand up, Diane Harrison is our vice president. Lucy works at the museum. Hillary is in charge of all of our children's programs. And yes, sir, can you please turn that off before we start? Uh, the library always sponsors our lectures, and we so appreciate that. Today we have our former yes, we have our former director of the Calvert Library, our wonderful Pat Hoffman, and we have Robin Petzler from the library who is still there working, working, working diligently. One more introduction, our mayor. Thank you, Mayor Frazier, for coming to each and every lecture. We certainly do appreciate it. And our current town council member, Mickey Hummel, who also moonlights as our videographer. So we really appreciate it. Without further ado, everybody's cell phones turned off, and we're going to start. It's my pleasure to introduce former town council member Gary Pendleton and a very renowned artist. Thank you. I didn't say it, but, um, that renowned part, I don't know. So I'm going to stand here because, so they can photograph me. So. Well, I, I just want to reiterate and thank you all for coming out on the view today. Um, I'm sure there are plenty of nice things you could be doing on a nice April day. So it's, um, it's really, uh, it's just wonderful to have everybody here. So, we don't have that much time, so why don't we just get started. Um, I, I, these first few slides we can scroll through, and um, because these give you some examples. We'll get to most of these as we go forward. These are examples of paintings that were done by artists, and you can stop right here, Gracie, uh, in the Mid-Atlantic and beyond, who painted um, the practice plein air painting. So, I think we need to let you know what plein air means. Well, there's really no exact English translation of this French term, um, but it sort of it suggests something that is done out in the plein air, uh, if, if, uh, if, if I know anything about the French language. But specifically, of or relating to painting outdoors. That, that doesn't mean painting your house, though I guess you could apply it that way. Um, um, but the second um, definition of or relating to a branch of Impressionism, which uh, applies an artistic approach to painting that attempts to recreate or suggest the effects of light outdoors. And uh, before, um, and you can, next slide, please. Um, here's some examples of some people um, in their plein air painting garb from uh, the 1920s. Um, and here's a modern day uh, plein air painter. Um, and he, you know, uh, why don't you pause here for a second, Gracie, because, um, well, I can catch up, and, um, and I think it's good to start off uh, a presentation sometimes with a joke. I don't really have any good <laughs> jokes, but I think this is pretty funny. Um, there's a bug, as you can see. Um, the editors of the book didn't see that. Um, and if you paint outdoors, you, in on a day like today, maybe, certainly uh, when the weather gets warmer, you're going to get bugs in your painting. And that's one way that you can prove to the world. Um, and so th this is a painting by an Annapolis painter named Sharon Liddig. And um, the, uh, the, uh, the editors, the publisher, um, just step out of the frame here for a second, maybe, um, decided they liked it so much that, that they wanted to use that as part of the decoration in the book. So at different chapter headings and other points, they've used that detail from the painting. And when I saw this, when they sent me the proofs, that was one of the first things I noticed. And I was, uh, I was a little upset because it, I thought, oh, this is, they're going to make a have to make a change. It's going to slow the process down. And then I thought, no, I kind of like it. <laughs> and uh, so the, the bug, you can look for the bug. Uh, it appears here and there in the book. It's not, it's not everywhere that you find that particular detail from that painting, but uh, it, is, it does show up occasionally, and I was told by a friend of mine who works in the publishing industry, 
as I turn on my mic, that they call that an Easter egg, something that you hunt for. Oh. So, and I, and I want to say as we move on to the next slide, we talk about plein air painting, and um, you know what the we talk about the definition, um, why people do it. We can talk about that a little bit, but why um, it's something that developed. Um, around the time of the French Impressionists. Actually, there were painters in Italy and other places who were taking their gear outdoors to paint the fleeting effects of light uh, in nature before the French Impressionists who, and they came, uh, uh, they, uh, they sort of became known as a group around the 1870s, the French Impressionists. So around that time was when it became possible to do this. Uh, before that time, Paint was uh, made in small batches, often by the, um, by the artists themselves or their assistants, stored um, in pig bladders um, and, um, and in other ways. And so the paint could only be made and kept in very small batches. But the invention of the lead collapsible tube was one of the primary um, uh, technological advances that allowed artists to actually go outdoors. And uh, I don't have any examples here in this, uh, in, in this show, but you can probably all picture in your mind some of the old master's paintings that were very brown and, um, and um, don't really convey completely the whole range of full spectrum of light. And, um, and it was because they were limited in what they could do. They were painting indoors mainly, they were painting from memory, and they also didn't have access to some of the more modern pigments that also came um, um, around at that same time, some of the bright cadmiums that allowed artists to go outside and actually have, uh, have a way of, um, of trying to capture those light effects. Now the focus of, of the talk today is on mid-Atlantic plein air painters, uh, who really haven't gotten their due until now. But um, I put this in just to remind me to tell you that uh, in other parts of the country, there were art colonies that existed um, in many places, including the all places on my list, Brown County, Indiana, um, where artists would gather uh, together in concentrations, where they lived close to each other, where they could socialize with one another and learn from one, one another. So, there is a rich tradition in this country, but in this particular region of the country, I, I don't think it's all that well known. For example, Pennsylvania. It, here in the Mid-Atlantic, the Pennsylvania Impressionists who concentrated in Bucks County are probably the best known group of um, painters from their time period who were doing this sort of thing. And here's a painting by one of, that, uh, one of the members of that group, Walter Stofield. Bucks County is north of Philadelphia, and that location allowed artists to have access to the New York art markets, the Philadelphia art markets, and also gave them opportunities to teach in both of those cities. Uh, Philadelphia was, uh, and perhaps still is, the kind of center of art education in the country. Though Maryland has one of the oldest art schools in the country as well. Here's another painting by one of the um, leaders of the Pennsylvania Impressionists, one of my favorites. Uh, this is, um, uh, his name will come to me in a minute, but um, William, Lathrop. William Lathrop, thank you. Lathrop was, um, um, he and his wife uh, uh, sponsored teas for um, the painters in the, uh, the Bucks County area every Sunday. So they were sort of uh, paternal figures uh, within that community, and his paintings are just wonderfully poetic, I think. Uh, here's another example of a, of a painting by William Lathrop. I borrowed heavily in my book collection to, uh, to show some slides. In order to put them in the book, I had to pay money and go through a lot of steps uh, to get them published. But for the slideshow, I, I, can, I can use other resources. So the next one. William Trost Richards was a, um, was a Pennsylvania artist who wasn't associated with the, uh, the group of painters known as the Pennsylvania Impressionists. Uh, he was a little bit older than, than that group of painters who were active in the early 20th century uh, to, up to about the mid 20th century. Um, Richards was um, and is one of Pennsylvania's best known landscape painters. Uh, this is an example of, of, a, of a work that I'm certain he painted 
uh, plein air, he painted outdoors. This is a tiny watercolor, um, and we can't see it here, but it's about three, it's less than three by five inches. It's almost the size of a business card, actually. And these, he painted hundreds of these, which he called coupons. And he, 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 he used those for a couple of reasons. One, they were records of a place and a time that he could then use to go back to his studio and develop large-scale paintings, which really is one of the original um, purposes of going outdoors to paint. Um, it's, uh, I believe that it's the only way to actually learn how to effectively portray uh, the effects of light and atmosphere in a painting. Uh, but it also can provide a, uh, a document, a uh, reference material that can be used to develop larger works. And remember, he didn't have a cell phone that he could snap a quick picture with and then go back and paint in his studio. This is how he did that. And he gave uh, many of these coupons to one of his patrons um, as kind of a thank you gift. All right, we're, we're talking about Pennsylvania. You really can't talk about Pennsylvania without mentioning the Wyatts, and if you're uh, someone who's very interested in art, um, you certainly know the name Wyatt. M.C. Wyatt was the uh, father figure in that family, uh, very well known as, um, as a great uh, illustrator of children's books, and um, he worked for magazines and book publishers during his time period. And he was a student of uh, Howard Pyle, uh, and uh, Pyle, uh, Pyle was from Wilmington, Delaware, and he had a school there um, that taught many of the, uh, the great uh, illustrators um, who um, were of that time, including M.C. Wyatt. And we'll talk a little bit more about Pyle and his influence when we talk about some other painters later on, if we get to them. So I wish we had more time to talk about the historical figures in, in Pennsylvania and the other states. It's a subject that fascinates me. But um, we, want, we also want to make sure we include um, and show examples of um, some contemporary painters. Ken Backhouse uh, lives in Pennsylvania. He's originally from Wisconsin. And uh, he has background in illustration. Um, and he's, uh, he's one of the best known um, artists today who practice this sort of this approach to, to painting whether you call it Impressionism or plein air painting or painterly realism is another term that's popular to use. Uh, Ken, Ken is someone with a national reputation and it's, it's certainly well deserved. Uh, Valerie Craig is, um, uh, lives outside of Philadelphia and uh, she's also someone who with a growing uh, reputation and I love Valerie's work a lot. Uh, she's a wonderful, she's a good friend and um, She's, um, one of the things I think that she's known for is, um, is her use of grades. Um, she, she understands how to take different colors and come up with a, combine them together in a mixture to create a neutral tone, whether it's a brown or a gray, or something with a little bit of, a little bit of that, uh, that she then um, uses as a background um, and kind of a, of a, um, of a basis for, a, painting and then from there she goes on and applies uh, more pure colors, more identifiable color notes such as the oranges and the blues you see but if, if we had I hope you can see this well enough um, you know of course nothing um, is there's no substitute for seeing the paintings in person but uh, if, if we could do that you could really see how she how she, she uses the, the grays so well and there's another example of her work here. And, uh, I spent a lot of time uh, in the suburbs of, outside of Philadelphia. Um, at least I have for the past few years because um, that's where my wife, Karen, Alina, so many of you know is from. And I think I've passed by this spot more than once, somewhere near uh, King of Prussia. Uh, this is Michelle Byrne, another Pennsylvania painter. Uh, Michelle always puts people in her paintings. It's really, I think, a signature um, uh, of her work. And uh, she, she likes to refer to uh, her work as um, 
kind of on the, the subject of the art of conversation. And in many of her paintings, you can see people interacting, uh, talking to one another, doing things together. And this is Brian Epley. Um, Brian lives outside of Harrisburg. And I'd like to um, talk a little bit about Brian's approach. Um, you don't see a lot of detail in Brian's work. You can see that um, he, he practices what a lot of painters are, are taught to practice, which is to emphasize the big shapes. The sky is a big shape, but the mountains in the back of this bridge are a big shape. You know, the side of the bridge, and then the undersides, and so on. He doesn't get caught up in um, putting in a lot of detail, and he lets you do that work. And Brian told me that when he first began studying painting seriously at the Art Students League in Manhattan, that his uh, professor wouldn't let him paint. For a long time, he wouldn't let him paint. He, 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 um, he made him make collages. So Brian had to go through magazines and find photographs or anything that he could that he could then cut out and use to put in a picture that would represent a big shape. So he would find things that had a large gray or a large brown or whatever color he was looking for. He would cut those out and he would basically paste them together like you might do in elementary school. And that taught him to learn how to assemble a painting without being able to put in a lot of the small details. And I, I think he learned his lesson very well. Well, that's it for Pennsylvania. So for all you Pennsylvanians out there, <laughs> sorry we couldn't spend more time with them, but we want to keep them there. Okay, Maryland, D.C. Um, we saw a photograph earlier of a group of gentlemen in there uh, looking like they were dressed to go to a funeral or something. And, you know, um, it's surprising for us these days to see people dress that way because it's, um, uh, we don't do it very much anymore. Uh, but back then, you weren't have to do anything if you were a gentleman, you wore a suit and tie. And so uh, this is, um, this is a, a photograph from the archives of the, uh, the Washington Society of Landscape Painters, which celebrated their 100th anniversary a few years ago. Uh, the group was formed when a, uh, two uh, artists who were out on a painting excursion um, just happened to run into each other by accident. And they decided to form a group that they then called the Ramblers and until the 1980s only allowed women. No, only allowed men. Only allowed men. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway. Um, and here's a painting by one of their, uh, uh, one of the foremost, foremost artists from, uh, from that group. Um, this is um, a spot I know uh, because I used to live closer to the Washington area. This is along the C&O Canal. Okay. Uh, I don't know where that is uh, exactly, but it's, um, it's, it's called Lock House Reflections. So there's one of the locks along the C&O Canal. And here's another photograph of a gentleman from that time period. And here's a painting that closely resembles what I have here today. In fact, it is the same painting. This is a painting by um, August Rowley, who uh, came to um, Washington, D.C. from uh, Minnesota, I believe. And he taught at the corporate. And he was the president of the uh, Washington Society of Landscape Painters, then known as the Ramblers, for quite a few years. And he is considered by art historians to be one of the foremost impressionist painters of his time period from south of the Mason Dixon Line. And uh, if, if we have time when, when, when we're done, please come up and take a close look at his painting. And here is um, one of his paintings uh, on the front cover of the catalog of the uh, WSLP, a centennial exhibit from a few years ago. A Southern Maryland scene, um, that's Leonardtown, approximately 1935. This painting, we believe, was painted in the mid-20s. 
And I have other examples here as well um, that um, you're free to come up and if, if your hands are clean, even touch, because I think there's nothing, there's something about the texture of, a, of, a, of an oil painting that uh, just adds to its, um, its interest. So feel free if you're, if you don't have a lot of grease and oil on your fingers to, uh, to do that. The Egley family, um, and we talked about the Wyeths briefly. Some of you may know, uh, uh, you know, may know the Wyeth family and their association with Pennsylvania. The Egley family, um, I think uh, you could say, are Maryland's uh, version of the Wyeth family. Um, uh, Bjorn Egley uh, was a portrait painter in the 1930s. And d during that time period, which as we uh, all know from history, and, uh, it was a very difficult time economically, uh, yet he was able to um, have a very successful career as a portrait painter during that time period in Washington. He painted uh, military leaders and um, uh, politicians and uh, you know, industrialists and so on. And his, uh, he and his wife had five children. Going to the next one here. Oh, here's five, his oldest son, Peter Egley. Peter is one of five uh, children of a Bjorn uh, Egley. Um, all of them, um, still alive, are uh, successful painters. Uh, Lisa Egley lives uh, not too far from here. Lisa lives up um, near Churchton, uh, Franklin Point, that area, north of Deal. Um, Lisa's the granddaughter of uh, Bjorn Egley, and uh, Lisa is an excellent painter. Uh, she has had, um, she and her father both had an exhibit at Maryland Hall in Annapolis recently, which was a wonderful event. And um, Lisa is very fortunate, uh, she's able to travel around and exhibit widely uh, uh, her landscape paintings. I think we have a few more examples of her plenary work. This was done in Annapolis. And we'll talk a little bit more about the Eggleys, but I want to introduce uh, a non-Maryland uh, artist who has had great influence uh, on painting in this region. Henry Henshee um, operated a school in uh, Cape Cod known as the Cape School of Art. Hen Henshee uh, took over that school from um, an artist named Charles Webster Hawthorne, who has an important place in American art history. Uh, Hawthorne died at a relatively young age Hawthorne was someone who learned from William Merrick Chase, who really is an iconic figure in um, American art. He was, Chase himself, who's meant here, I've shown examples of his work. Chase was one of the Americans who went over to France um, during the time of the French Impressionists to find out what was going on over there. Met Monet and some of the other French Impressionists. And he and a handful of others brought those ideas back into this country and they spread. And the, the French Impressionists are well known, uh, but I think that, um, in my opinion, I think that their legacy has been far surpassed by um, Impressionist painters in this country. Um, so you have Chase, and then an example of Hawthorne from, from his very um, influential book called Hawthorne on Painting. And then below that is a, uh, is a portrait of Henry Henshee. Um, and then I threw in this other one, um, which we probably just don't have time to talk about. <laughs> Fortunately. So, just very briefly, Hawthorne is credited with developing a new approach to painting, in which the, the idea of juxtaposing strong light and strong shadow elements in a painting opposite one, one another, again, without putting in a lot of detail. He required his painters, his uh, students to go out on the beach and he gave them putty knives and he had them paint uh, um, portraits, sketches of, um, in, in oil of, um, of people standing on the beach. So he didn't want his students to put in a lot of detail. Um, and these, th these, were, these were done for educational pur purposes. The idea was to understand how to effectively uh, place and here's an example done by um, Cedric Egley, a member of the Egley family. 
figured on a beach, not a lot of detail, but you get that sense, light, shadow, warm and cool, one against the other. It creates this sort of color vibration, um, actually. Um, Cedric, one of the uh, uh, second oldest of the, uh, the Egley family, um, and Cedric became the student of Henry Henschey. I know I'm throwing a lot of names out there. And he, um, he, he came back to the Annapolis area where he taught and still does teach and paint. He's a fine portrait painter. And he uh, encouraged his students to go to the Cape School of Art and learn directly from Henry Henschey. And those students, some of which, uh, of the examples of their work coming up, let's see who's next. Okay, John Ebersberger, one of the best known students to come out of that tradition. John is an Annapolis painter, brought some of those ideas about using a new way. Of, I can't even, uh, John himself is very eloquent. He could, he could talk at length about the, the concepts behind this, but you can see in this painting this powerful effect of, of, of light and color. It really is very dramatic. Here's another one of, of John's outdoor still lifes. Um, and Lee Boynt is, a, is another Annapolis painter who studied with Henry Henschey. And there's one of these paintings. Okay, here's the painting with bug in it. <laughs> uh, Sharon Liddig uh, also comes out of that tradition. And, and I want to emphasize that in the Annapolis area, there is a particular strain of American Impressionist painting that is quite strong. And if you go up to Annapolis and you tour around, look at some of the galleries, get to know some of the artists and get familiar, to be familiar with their work, you, you will be able to recognize this, uh, this style. Abigail McBride, also uh, part of that tradition. Now here's a painter who doesn't fit into any particular tradition, doesn't, didn't, never isn't identified with a school of painting or a group of painters. Louis Feitler was a Baltimore artist, um, 1885, 1957, was a child prodigy, began studying on scholarship at the Maryland Institute College of Art before he was a teenager, if I'm not mistaken, at a very young age at any rate. And Feitler um, was a superb draftsman, which meant that he could draw very well. And he also knew how to handle both watercolor and oil paint in a way that showed an understanding of light and atmosphere that I think comes out of what the Impressionists taught. And here's a very small oil painting. You can see how small that is of his boat. And he was someone who was quite a solitary figure. Uh, he worked uh, for a company that um, uh, created, um, he was a silver chaser and designer. A chaser is someone who actually, uh, they created uh, fancy tea sets and other kind of silverware and um, things like that. If you go to the Maryland State House, you will find in the State House lobby a large uh, piece from, a, from a, one of the, uh, a, a large uh, tea set or, or silver service. That's, that's what I'm term I'm looking for, that was created for uh, NAIC, the USS Maryland, which no longer exists. But the service itself is in the possession of the Maryland archives, and a large piece from that service is on display at the State House. And it's, uh, we believe that, that Feuter was um, not only designed it, but, but may have also done, uh, using the, the chasing tools, created the, the images on the silver itself. But we should move on and talk about some other Maryland traditions. Uh, Hans Schuler was a sculptor who was the president of the Maryland Institute College of Art until his death. Um, and uh, when he died, uh, th things, ch things were changing in the art world at the time. Um, you know, when we think about Impressionist painting and people painting outdoors, uh, if you study that, you'll find it was something that was done a lot during the early part of the last century, but then um, post-war, it really went out of fashion. Representational painting, which meant to create works of art that look realistic, representational painting, became very passe during that time. Abstract Impressionism was the big thing, and um, 
if you were doing uh, traditional forms of art, um, uh, many of those people were who had been successful were no longer able to sell paintings. So the just if we can just go back a second, I just want to point out the um, the studio there is from the Schuler School in Baltimore, and um, where they teach sculpture as well as drawing and painting. You know. This is a painting by um, Hans Schuler's daughter-in-law, who along with her husband uh, opened up the opened the um, created the Schuler School of Art in Baltimore around 1960. Um, they did that because they wanted to have a place where traditional arts and the teaching of traditional art and art forms was, was respected, where there was a place for it, because there really no longer was a welcome place for that kind of teaching at MICA and at many other art schools. And here are some examples of paintings done by some of the faculty at the Schuler School. One of the faculty members who came, who, uh, uh, came with the, uh, the Schulers when they opened their school was Jacques Merage. Merage um, uh, came to this country um, before the beginning of World War II to escape Nazism. He was the uh, technical director at the Louvre Museum in Paris, and he brought with him knowledge of old master techniques and materials. And when the Schulers uh, started, he was at MICA, and uh, he, he left there to, um, to help the Schulers found the Schulers School. Uh, John Bannon was uh, Merger's assistant uh, when he was a student at uh, the Schulers School in the 50s and 60s. Um, and we don't have one, an example of John's work here, but if, if we did, you would see that unlike some of the paintings I brought with me today, and unlike a lot of the other uh, impressionist and, and plein air paintings that you might you might see the finish and the, the surface of John's work is very smooth and very polished. He gives this very smooth finished look to his paintings, and that that is a, a result of his use of the medium. I mentioned the Merger medium, or maybe I did mention, but one of the techniques that that Jacques Merger brought over was a was the the recipe for a medium. A medium is something that is used to add to oil paints to um, to uh, change or improve the working quality of the paints. And um, use of that medium uh, allows, uh, causes the paint to dry quickly and allows for a, a process called glazing, which means the artist can put successive layers of somewhat semi-transparent paint one over the other, allowing the lower layers to show through. So it, it, it allows greater control in many cases, but it also uh, um, creates a different kind of look to a painting than, um, than you may get otherwise. Here's John Sills. John is a Baltimore area painter who is a graduate of the Schuler School. Uh, John does these wonderful um, Whistler-inspired um, moody landscape paintings. John is someone who's had a lot of success recently uh, getting a national reputation for himself. And he's a great guy and is well deserved. Uh, Carol Lee Thompson, another a Schuler School graduate, and again, if, if we could, I, I think you can see it in the upper left, there is a little bit of texture in, in, in this, where you see the sun coming through in that painting. That's the kind of texture I'm referring to uh, that you find in most plein air paintings, but for the most part, her work has that kind of smooth, very polished uh, finish to it. Now, at the same time that the Schulers began um, um, teaching um, at their School in Baltimore. Changes were taking place back at the Maryland Institute College of Art. Uh, Eugene Leak was a uh, Yale-trained uh, artist um, who came to MICA and um, um, created an, uh, an opportunity um, for artists to, um, uh, to learn more traditional approaches to painting, more realistic approaches to painting. Uh, hired instructors who, who uh, taught in that approach and just created a more welcoming atmosphere for, for artists to, um, to go back uh, to, to, that, to that kind of painting. And one of the uh, professors he hired, who is still at MICA today, um, he's been there since the 1960s, is Raoul Middleman. Um, um, 
Middleman has had a couple of um, very well uh, received um, exhibits, retrospectives of his work in the Baltimore area recently. Uh, here's a guy who does like to put a lot of paint on his, um, on his uh, canvas. And you can see a very expressive quality in, in, the, in his work. Um, and uh, the rhythm, you know, uh, rhythm is real important in painting, I think. And I think you can see that, you can feel that rhythm in, in his work. Uh, a friend of mine who was a student of, of his um, told me what I thought was a pretty funny story. Again, you know, these, these paintings are very expressive, okay, very alive. And he came up to my friends uh, when he was trying, working on a painting and said to him, well, I see your palette is more expressive than your painting. <laughs> Which, if you paint, you know, you get a lot of paint on your palette and it can be quite colorful and interesting. <laughs> and if you're in a situation where your palette is more interesting than your painting, you know, you know that you've got some issues you need to work on. <laughs> anyway, so here's another great example of his work. And not for everybody. Not everyone is a big fan of this kind of thing. They, you know, uh, people, some people want something a little more beautiful, a little more calming. But um, uh, you know, he, he goes at it with a, with a lot of um, with a lot of vigor, and I think he gets good results. Uh, here's some examples of um, paintings by Mike students. Um, to the left is a watercolor by Mike Catarba, uh, who's the guy who told me that story I just relayed. And uh, John Eisenman is an Eastern Shore painter who did the painting on the upper right. And uh, Bruno Barron uh, did, did the lower right painting. Of course, that's a little bit cut off, but you can, you can get a sense of, um, I think you can see a little bit of Middleman's influence there. Here's another watercolor by Mike Catarba, Mike a student, Mike a grad. And Susan Graver is a Baltimore area painter, uh, also went to Micah. As did Lisa Mitchell, who paints in oil mm -hmm. as well as pastel. And, uh, Lisa does beautiful work. Um, Greg Johansson is a Calvert County um, resident, and he, he uh, is a pastelist. You know what pastel is? Okay. I mean, sometimes the term pastel is used to apply to very light kind of certain certain kind of color, a certain uh, value in, in, in decorating or that sort of thing. Pastels are actually, they're, they're chalk filled with paper, in case you didn't know. Um, so that's, that's the medium that Greg uses. And I think we have, yeah, there's another. Um, the first painting of Greg's was, was done in Solomon's. This is from, uh, that's, that's, uh, this is Haverty Grace. And Lou Gerbots is, um, is also a Maryland painter, a uh, Calvert County painter. Luke is a fine watercolorist. Okay, Lynn Lockhart is a Maryland painter, mm -hmm. and if you like dogs and other animals, um, just look her up online. I'll say that again. If you like dogs, mm -hmm. you want to see a fine thing, look her up online. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, you you would be very you'll be delighted. Uh, Kirk McBride, another Eastern Shore Maryland painter. Julai Chong, this is a nocturne, as you can see, painted in Easton at the Maritime Museum. This, this won a uh, top prize at the Easton Plein Air Painting Competition a number of years ago. Julai is someone with it who's nationally known, just, just wonderful work. And here are some examples. This is useful to uh, look at. The lower right is a very small uh, 8 by 10 sketch, smaller than this painting here that she did at Sky Meadow State Park in Virginia. The larger painting, 30 inches by 40, is what she developed in the studio based on her small sketch. Tim Bell, I wish we had a better picture. I do have one of Tim's paintings here. Tim, li Tim lives in Anne Arundel County. And um, Tim just does these great, big, bold, very expressive paintings. Um, and he's someone else who um, is, has a national reputation. And Stephen Griffin uh, from Easton. Uh, what can you say? Just, just really wonderful work. Eva Carson is a, is based in Baltimore. Uh, works in pastel and oils. 
And Claudia Brooks is also a Baltimore area painter who paints in oil. Stuart White also from Baltimore is a tremendous watercolor painter. Um, to be able to pull off a painting, I don't have the size indicated here, but it's not a small painting. And to pull off something like that using watercolor, which is really a master's medium, because you, you really, it's almost impossible to fix mistakes. Uh, you, you have to lay things down correctly the first time. And, uh, he's, uh, he's very gifted. There's the small watercolors. Uh, David Grafton is also based in Easton. Um, just does beautiful work. I, Leslie uh, Veloso is from Salisbury. Oh, oh, that's me. Oh. The, the, the lower right one is a certainly a Southern Maryland scene at the back of the yard. Mm -hmm. That was done um, at the Jug Bay Wetland Sanctuary. And the, the uh, one in the upper left is um, is from up in Pennsylvania. Susquehanna River Valley. The lower right is where? The Junpei Wetland Sanctuary in um, Lothian. Oh. It's Anna Yeah, it's, it's you know, Anna Lundy. And Curtis is another Maryland painter um, who's really just, she, you know, really t through, through um, largely self-taught. Someone who's just through focus and determination has made herself into a really wonderful. Henry Coe lives in Baltimore County. Michael Godfrey, Columbia, Michael's work is stunning. Just is that oil? Is that oil? What is it? That's an oil painting. Wow. Wow. And some of the ones I've shown you, I'm not sure were all done on site and plein air, on plein air, but I will tell you whether this is a plein air painting or not, I can't say for sure off the top of my head. You can't do something like that unless you've had a lot of experience taking your easel outdoors and trying to do that. It's, 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 it's just, I, I just don't think it's possible to learn how to con convey a scene like that so realistically uh, unless you at least uh, spend, you know, practice a lot of time outdoors learning how, how, to, how to do that. You would only have a few hours to do that. The light would change so dramatically. That's an excellent comment. Yeah. You have about two hours. Yeah. Basically. You have about. Now, sometimes, you can take stuff back home and finish it as long as you're not changing things drastically. Or in many cases, a painter will start a painting on one day and then it'll come back a few days later or maybe even a year later, but it has to be the same time of year, same time of day, and the light conditions have to be very close. And that's one way where you can, and I've done that, uh, that's one way you can, uh, I've done that years later. I finished a painting just uh, last week that I started two years ago. But I, I knew that I would have a chance someday to go back to that spot, and I would happen to be there when the light was right, and I was able to, able to finish it. Here's another one of Michael's paintings. I'm pretty sure that was plein air. And we're getting into Jersey now, but we're also just about running out of time. How much more time do we have? Well, we usually allow 15 minutes for questions. You could, is it? You know, you could just let these scroll. I mean, if you just put them on automatically so people can see the images. Um, you know, I think I've given you um, enough information so you get the idea what it's all about. Uh, if you go to the other states, you can also find a history of painters who've done this sort of thing and are doing it today. And if you're really interested, you can pick up a copy of the book and uh, find out who those people are. But uh, really, I welcome you to, to come up if you want to take a look at the book. Um, if you'd like to buy a copy, we can certainly make that happen. But uh, come up and take a look at some of these paintings up close. And, um, and and get a better idea of um, of what it's all about. And thank you thank for coming. You. And you have any I can't believe that was 45 minutes. I, I I thought, oh, we're going through this too fast, and I'm not spending enough time on these things. But, uh, we're just getting warmed up. Yeah. Oh well. We, you want to leave the audience wanting more. Well, you know what? I don't really take issue if they are, because if they, if you can paint a painting that looks like uh, it was done in plein air or shows that you've had that kind of training, then that's all you've done. I think most of these people may, well, we all take photographs. 
but they're best used as reference material figuring out, okay, what was the shape of this object? You know, um, instead, you know, as opposed to what, what was the color? What was the color effect of, of that object? Because photographs in the story. Oh, can you come back just one second? I just want to mention Ethel Leach. I have a painting by Ethel Leach here. It's, it's not a plein air painting, but my grandparents uh, collected work from this Delaware artist who was one of the students of N.C. Wyatt, who we talked about earlier. Uh, so, um, so please, questions? Yes. Yeah, you said that you have maybe two hours when you're outdoors to capture what you want to do. Right. So you almost have to have a photo to come back and use it. Or, or it is one of the characteristics of the sun air painting that they do it very quickly in two hours? Well, um, all of those really are possible. I mean, some there's there's a certain beauty to something that has this sort of unfinished look, where you don't take it too far, where you put in enough information that it conveys the truth of what you're trying to get at without putting in a lot of details. Um, or in many cases, as I've said before, some artists exclusively use plein air paintings as something that they will then refer to to do a larger studio piece, or just to sharpen their skills. You know, and uh, I mean, there are times when I, I will spend more than two hours, but at that point, I'm basically doing finishing touches. I'm not changing anything that's really crucial to the painting at that point, because the light conditions have changed enough so that even even if it's still sunny out, let's say, um, it's it's not the same kind of light. The shadows are in different places, but it's not just that. It's just light is reflecting from in different ways. Um, if you have a lot of blue in the sky, which happens later in the day on a sunny day, that blue is going to be seen in the ground plane and everywhere else in the painting because that ambient light coming down from directly overhead is getting into what you're painting. And that that um, that same you know degree of blueness in a painting might not occur in a painting that was done earlier in the day or on a day when it's not sunny. I would think that part of this this technique is running out of time. I think sometimes painters will, if you give three hours, they'll spend three right. hours in just two, but they've already got a painting in two hours. Sometimes the time pressure is a good thing yeah. because it forces you to make decisions quickly, to not overwork areas, to not put in too much detail, leave things out, et cetera, et cetera. So I saw another hand raised. I, I was going to say, um, or ask, um, why do you think there's been a resurgence in interest in funny enough? Is there a reason behind it? Or just... Well, I think that you'll find a lot. Things tend to swing like a pendulum one way or the other. And, you know, I think that people, I think there's a, people have hunger for this sort of thing. You know, people, um, people want to, uh, to have beautiful things. Um, and also, I think it has to, part of it has to do with demographics. You know, the people my age, you can guess my age, approximately how old I am, who um, ha now have the opportunity to go out. And maybe they had careers in art, or maybe they did something else. Maybe they were teachers, or maybe they did something totally related. But um, it's been described as the new golf. So it's an outdoor activity, you know, that isn't terribly strenuous, gets you out in a beautiful place, meet new friends. And, 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 you know, um, there are all kinds of new products. This is a, you know, this is a French easel. That's what they call this, by the way, one of my props. But now you can find so many, there's so many uh, new products on the market that are improvements on, on you know, on this easel. They don't look anything like this. But, um, but it's still, you find a lot of people who, uh, who use this kind of contraption out there today. So please come take a look at this painting by Rolle. Uh, one of the, you know, an American master painter. Um, you don't have to go to a museum. Some of the other works. Thank you, Thank you.